Well, we are uh, really privileged tonight to have Doug Grant with us, uh, K1DG. I, I had the hear, a pr privilege of hearing him uh, a couple of places, but at uh, Contest University and at the Dayton Antenna uh, Forum. Uh, but he's going to talk about optimizing your station for contest operation. And if you have not, uh, his book is excellent. Especially, I wish I'd have had that when I started contesting. Uh, in fact, uh, it's just got a lot of great little hints in it, and I encourage you to do that. Uh, Doug's been licensed since 1967, and over the years, he's got plaques for just about everything. High score for single op, single op assisted, multi-single, multi-two, multi-multi, uh, from his own station and from other host stations. Uh, I think something that's really impressive is that he's been a competitor at six of the World Radio Team Championships, which you know, our, our Olympics really of contesting. And he won a gold and two bronze medals. So, I mean, wow. Uh, past president of the Yankee Clipper Club. Uh, he is chairman of the ARL Contest Advisory Committee, a member of the CQ Worldwide Contest Committee. He's chaired the Dayton uh, ARL Contest, Advi uh, Contest Forum for over 20 years. So if you've been to Dayton and gone to the contest, you, you, you've heard our speaker. Uh, he speaks at Contest University. And um, he was the chairman of the World Radio Team Championship in 2014 that was held in the East. Some of you have read the book Radio Sport. And uh, uh, Chris uh, Halbert, uh, who won, uh, was one of the winning teams there, who's actually speaking uh, next month for us and a member of our club, um, well, Doug is the one that actually put that together, and it was incredible. I enjoyed watching it. And so we just are really counting it a joy to have um, uh, Doug with us. And so, Doug, we're going to turn it to you, and uh, you should be able to share your screen. And uh, everybody, if you if you don't mind muting, that would be great. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Okay, now I see my screen, but not in. Now slide. we now I'm seeing your PowerPoint. Okay, how about if I do? Let's see, resume slideshow. Yep, no. you're all set now. <clears throat> hey, all right. Okay, so uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to uh, to speak to you guys. Um, as uh, as Mel said, this is a presentation that I originally did at uh, for Contest University last year. So you're gonna get a little bit of a rerun, but uh, uh, maybe there's some new material in here that'll be useful for you. So we're gonna talk about optimizing the station for contesting. Now, what does optimize mean? It means to make as effective, perfect, or useful as possible, or to make the best of. And we're gonna discuss optimizing your station within some set of constraints. So you have a station, uh, you have a radio, some antennas, and you wanna use it for contesting. First thing is you have to figure out what your goals are, figure out how much money you've got to spend and how much time, uh, budget is both, both money and time, and uh, figure out what, uh, what to do indoors of your, uh, with your station and what to do outdoors. First, let's talk about your goals. Think about what contests you prefer doing, whether they're domestic contests like the NAQP, sweepstakes, a sprint, uh, DX contests, or the World Works World events like WPX and IARU. VHF contesting for that matter. And what modes do you prefer? Do you prefer phone, CW, RIDI, Digi? There's lots of things to, to figure out and they're all gonna impact uh, how you put your effort into optimizing your station. Now, what do you want to accomplish? Do you wanna do better than last year? That's always a good thing. Do you wanna beat the guy across town that beat you last year? Do you want to set a new record for some obscure county in Washington that no one ever operates in the 7QP? Um, do you want to win your section, your state, your call area, division, country, the world? What's, what, what's, what are your goals? And be realistic. Um, if you're new to contesting or haven't done a whole lot of it, uh, chances are you're not going to win the CQ Worldwide the first time up for the world. So. Things like, you know, this looks like fun. What will it take for me to win the CQ Worldwide? Uh, P.S. I live in an HOA restricted community in Wisconsin and I will have a trap dipole in the attic. That's not really an opportunity to win the CQ Worldwide contest. 
So you need to do a fair assessment of your situation. Uh, what's your level of operating experience? Uh, have you been doing it forever or you're just starting out or have you done it for a little while and wanna, wanna get a little better at it? What's your station's real capability today um, that focuses on your antenna and your equipment? And do you have some real limitations on possible improvements, HOA, uh, living situation, whatever? And you have to establish your budget and your timeline. Improving your station capabilities is gonna cost some money. And if you're not familiar with that big word, Tanstoffel, it's an old term from economics that says there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. So everything costs. Now, those improvements can be incremental over a period of months, seasons, years. Uh, and improving your operating skill actually costs nothing, just time. So you have to improve your station, which can be done gradually um, and uh, here and there. But improving your operating skill is just a matter of how much time you put into it. Now, when it comes to spending money, this is a quote that I saw online from W2RE, who's one of the movers and shakers of remote ham radio. And uh, somebody wants to win the CQ Worldwide and wants a remote contest station built in Maine. He's got a half a million bucks and uh, there you go. So that's one way of solving the problem, but not everybody has that kind, uh, that kind of money to spend on a contest station. So let's talk about the indoor improvements you might make to your station. Uh, when it comes to equipment, um, obviously people use transceivers now. If you're trying to do contesting with separate receiver and transmitter, you're living in the stone age, you need to buy a transceiver. Um, and you don't have to buy the latest or greatest one either. Um, pretty much anything made after 2010 is adequate. Um, a radio, if you look on the Rob Sherwood charts, uh, any radio with better than 75 or 80 dB of dynamic range is just fine for sideband. You need a little bit more for CW because signals don't splatter quite as far. Um, and uh, so you need a little bit better performance for CW contesting. Uh, a rig that was designed for mobile use is usually inadequate, but I'm not gonna take sides on a particular manufacturer over another. Uh, choose one with a user interface you like, because that's really what it comes down to these days. Don't get hung up on buying the latest and greatest models. And as you can see, ICOM is one of the sponsors of Contest University and Ray Novak cringes when I tell people that, but it's true. Um, and I can tell you for a fact that the CQ Worldwide Top USA score has been made several times using 20 year old radios and even older amplifiers. So you don't need the latest and greatest. Now optimizing the radio performance um, for receiving um, it's very tempting to put the preamp on to try and boost those signals up. But the truth is you really don't need it, except maybe on 10 meters with most radios. Um, learn how to adjust your filters, especially if you have one of the newer radios that has uh, a lot of SDR filtering and the, the DSP filtering. You need to learn how to adjust them um, so that you don't, uh, uh, you're not cutting out too much of the signal you want. Uh, we just had a discussion on the YCCC reflector where a guy who's just beginning to do CW contesting, was looking for advice. And uh, um, he was saying that he always operates with his uh, CW filters uh, at 150 Hertz. And uh, a lot of guys jumped on him and said, well, you're missing a lot of guys if you're not using your RIT and turning around. Um, and so you really need to get comfortable with how to adjust your filters. Um, the radios that I've been using lately, I have uh, an ICOM 7610 on the desk here. And it's got very nice controls, uh, the twin passband tuning for um, cutting the high side of the filter or the low side of the filter. So yeah, you just need to get used to using those. And that's pretty much all you need to know about receiving. If you're in a case, a situation where you have very loud signals, a lot of the time, sometimes writing the RF gain down will uh, help you to uh, separate signals calling in a pileup. On transmitting, uh, on sideband, you, you learn how to use your speech processor. Don't just jack it up all the way to 11. Um, that's uh, not a good thing. Listen to your monitor so you, uh, so you sound good. You don't want a whole lot of background noise. You also don't want to be too muffled and quiet. Uh, learn how to use your Vox. Um, there are several controls. Learn how to use them so that the Vox is not tripping when a loud guy calls in. Um, if you have a radio with adjustable CW rise time, get into that menu and uh, slow it down. A lot of radios are being shipped with rise times that are way too fast and cause key clicks and you don't wanna be a bad neighbor. 
other things that uh, you can do indoors in your station. Um, if you want to enter the high power category, obviously you need an amplifier. And uh, as people upgrade to the latest solid state and auto tune amplifiers, used tube amplifiers are becoming very, very available at excellent prices. Um, you can get AL 1200s pretty cheap. Um, that, that's what I use. Um, and uh, I, I have a couple of old Alpha 76s at my station in Maine that I use. And uh, 1500 watts from one of those are just as loud as 1500 watts from a KPA 1500 or a Power Genius or any one of those uh, other auto everything amplifiers. Uh, there's only a few knobs you have to turn. If you don't change bands very often, it's not that much of a penalty. Um, you need a computer that's capable of running contest software. Obviously, you don't need one as, uh, oh, you need one better than mine that's too slow going between tasks. Um, so uh, you don't really have to share your screen, but you have to be able to run the contest software. Uh, you need a comfortable headset. You can't really do contesting with a speaker. You need headphones. And if you're going to do a phone contest, you need a headset. So your microphone's right in front of you all the time. Uh, you need a watt meter so you can see if everything's okay. A tuner if, if needed. Maybe a remote antenna switch control box. Um, I like the cross needle watt meters because I can instantly tell if I'm on the wrong antenna or something's wrong because the, the two needles are both moving. As far as uh, software automation and all that jazz, um, don't get too carried away with the software. Um, you should only automate the basic functions you need. Um, let's see, it's asking me to admit someone to from the waiting room, but I can't get my mouse. I just open. admitted him. You got them in. Okay, good. Um, don't get carried away with the software. You can you can get there's stuff with way too many features out there. Um, keep it simple uh, so you spend more time operating than you do debugging interfaces and uh, software um, databases and stuff. Um, the the computer should do the CW sending, the radio frequency control, maybe antenna and band switching, and that's pretty much it. Um, in my view, a lot of logging programs have way too many features and way too many distractions. And you find, you find yourself getting decoupled from what's happening on the air. So you wanna spend more time on the air and less time configuring, debugging ports, and databases and all that stuff. Um, get rid of anything that's unnecessary that's on the desk. Anything you touch often, the radio, or the amplifier, the computer, obviously the keyboard, um, should be easy to reach and everything else shouldn't be taking up any space on your desk. So look around your station and decide whether you have stuff on there that's, that looks pretty, looks nice, but really doesn't help you make contacts any faster. Lots of monitors and displays, for example, might impress visitors, but it won't help you make any contacts. So I grabbed a few station pictures uh, from here and there on the web and I just wanna, I, I can't even remember who most of them are which is just as well. If one of them is yours, I don't need to embarrass you. Um, but this is a very cool looking station. It looks like mission control um, for NASA, but it's not necessary for contesting. There's way too many monitors. There's way too much information there. Um, when it comes to ergonomics, let me, let me back up. One of, the, one of the things that obviously impacts how well you do in a contest is how much time you spend operating or as we like to call it, butt in chair time. If you want to increase that butt in chair time, improve your chair. Um, you don't need a fancy chair, um, lots of places to get them, but you can see what the posture is that you're aiming for. So you need to get the desk height and the chair height and everything set up so that you're looking straight ahead at the screen at the monitor. Um, what we do is a lot like uh, secretarial work because we're mostly typing and uh, uh, doing what gamers do. So gamer chairs, I'm sitting in a gamer chair now. Um, and uh, the chair in my other operating position over there um, is a secretarial chair. Um, those are both good choices. If you're setting up your station for the first time, the desk height uh, depends on how tall you are. Um, I, did, I did a presentation once on station ergonomics and I noticed it in the audience. Uh, W1UE, who's about four foot ten, was sitting right next to NR5M, who's about six foot six. And when I got to this slide, I said, "Now, if you have uh, W1UE and NR5M both guest hopping at your station, and I had them stand up, um, obviously they need chairs with adjustable height uh, because they're very different. So 
you need to pick the chair height and uh, the desktop height that fits you the best. Uh, tw I find that um, about 28 and a half, 29 inches seems to be seems to work about right. Um, my uh, feet can reach the floor um, and they can reach the bar across the bottom of the bench so I can rest my feet up there if I want. Now here's an interesting one. How well do you know your own station? And one of the things is how long can it take you, does it take you to change bands? You should be able to change bands in five seconds or less. If it takes a lot more, um, figure out what's taking all the time and figure out if you can automate it. If it's tuning up your amplifier, um, take a piece of paper, tape it to the front of the amplifier and mark the tuning and loading controls for each band so that you can just set the dials there and uh, be done with it instead of you know dialing around, watching the watt meter and all that. Um, if you have an antenna tuner that you have to adjust, um, do the same thing with that. Um, are any controls that are, require adjustment clearly marked and intuitive? There are some things you can automate like antenna switching. And this is the, the one that's always embarrassing for most of us. Um, there is something intermittent in your station. For every one of you that's listening, I don't know what it is, but you do. And you know you should fix it. And it will break during the contest. And so you should fix it now, not uh, during the contest. So I talked before about incremental improvements in your station adding up sort of like compound interest. Um, here's a guy who has improved his station over the years. And around 1970, his novice station was an HW16, which many of you are probably too young to remember. Um, around the mid seventies, he upgraded to a Drake C line. Um, also maybe too old for some of you to remember. Um, in uh, 2012, um, there are some major station improvements. Um, no, he did not get surgery. That's a guest operator at his station. This is actually the N6TV station, and that was N6TV in the two previous pictures. This is actually K6NAA, who is the daughter of K6NA, who operated Bob's station in the rookie roundup that year and uh, won it. But you can see his station has uh, improved, and you can see all his color-coded markings for uh, tuning up his, um, his antenna tuner for 80 meters and uh, his manual tune amplifiers. This is his 2020 station. It's a lot simpler. Uh, he still has the antenna tuners where he needs them, um, but he's gone to uh, solid state amplifiers that don't require any tuning um, and uh, two K3s right next to each other. And uh, it's a very efficient, very compact station. So let's look at a few other stations. Um, this one. Uh, the radios are too far apart if he wants to do single op two radio. Um, and uh, the paddle and the key are too far from the left radio. If you have to send, if he has to send by hand while he's uh, tuning something in, he, he's going to have very, very long arms. So this is a station that has too many speakers. I see two of them on the desk there. There's probably another one around someplace. And uh, he only has one rotator. So he's got the uh, speaker to rotator ratio is all wrong. This guy's got plenty of rotators, that's good. I don't see any speakers, that's also good. Um, but I think he's probably got too many rotators. And if he can remember which rotator is on which antenna, he's uh, probably doing okay. But uh, boy, that's a lot of work to th think about all that. Here's a station went in a little different direction. Um, this is a station set up for single op two radio and you don't see any rotators. Um, the station was uh, the old HC8N location in the Galapagos and they just point it everything's sort of north, uh, some antennas fixed on Europe, some fixed on the US and uh, just switch between them. There was really not much need for a rotator there and they couldn't keep them working anyway in, the, in that environment. Oh, but that keyboard is way too small. You, should, you need a real full-size keyboard. You can't really type on a laptop keyboard. Here's another station. I think the radios are up too high. The monitor is up way too high. That's a stiff neck just waiting to happen. Uh, this guy's got two monitors. Uh, I don't know if he's doing single op four radio low power. I don't see any amplifiers there. Uh, or maybe I'm just seeing double. Um, but uh, those radios up top are probably not going to get used in the contest. This station is just way too neat. I, I, no, one, no one should see a station like this. There should be some paper scattered around and um, some cables hanging all over the place. And um, that's just no good at all. This is much more like it, except that there's a lot too much, there's too much manual switching. One thing that's nice about this station is the radios are the same 
and the amplifiers are the same. Um, and if you have a spare uh, one of each, that's even better. Uh, so you know kind of how everything works and you don't have to remember this radio tunes up this way and that radio or that amplifier tunes up a different way. Um, so this is not too bad, but it's very manual and some automated antenna switching would go a long way. This is also a very nicely arranged station. Uh, the VHF contesting position on the left, HF contesting position on the right. You see the amplifiers are up high. I've seen some stations where guys put amplifiers and then put a shelf on top of them. That's a good way to lose, lose your tubes because things will get too hot. This guy's got some big monitors. Um, I think maybe he's compensating for something else in his life. I don't know, but um, I don't think you really need that much of a display. Okay, so there's some critiques on stations inside, indoors. Let's talk about things you can improve on your station outdoors. Um, your antenna system is obviously the thing I'm talking about, and that includes everything in the system, feed lines, connectors, and the antennas. The optimum type of antenna and height might be different for different types of contests and your location. There are lots of other talks about antenna stuff in past CTUs, but antenna system improvements are usually the best bang for the buck in station improvements. That's where you can make the biggest difference for the least amount of money. Now, here's some interesting data that uh, you might want to file away for future reference. A 1 dB improvement in your signal corresponds to a 6% improvement in your contest score. Okay, so if you want your score to be bigger, you can move from low power to high power. That's a good thing. And uh, we actually had an interesting test case with that. Um, back a few years ago, N1UR, who usually operated low power in the CQ Worldwide, switched to turning on an amplifier. So he was the same operator, same antennas, same location. All he did was turn on the amplifier and his score increased by about 70 or 75%, which you would figure out from 13 dB um, of improvement um, at 6% per dB. And you can see there um, at the red curves of the top high power scores for several years. And you can see N1UR in 2014, jumping up to the high power category and his score going way, 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 way up. And uh, that's uh, just by turning on the amplifier. And it's fairly linear, I think. Um, so that if you, uh, if you can add three dB, you can improve your score by 18 or 20%. So every dB counts. So by improving your antenna by one dB, it'll improve your score in the same category. The first few dB are not too expensive. Let's talk about 15 meter antennas. If your antenna is a ground plane or vertical on poor ground, it's a zero dBi antenna. Um, and it works, as they used to say, equally poorly in all directions. Now, you probably learned at one point in your life that a 40 meter dipole will load up on 15 meters, and it will, and it's got about 2.8 dB of gain. And I'll say that a dipole costs about 50 bucks to put up. That's 18 bucks per dB. A two element wire beam pointed in a direction you like, that's five dB of gain. It's about the same cost as two dipoles still about 20 bucks per dB. But after you get to 10 dB improvement, each additional dB costs a lot. You can see in that range on the left from going from a, a dipole to a, a three or four element beam, the slope of that curve is about $200 per dB. Um, when you've already got a six element beam and you're going to try and improve that, that dB from 11 dB of gain to 12 dB of gain costs about $800. So it gets very expensive up at the high end. Now for the high bands, a tower mounted beam is a very nice thing to have, but there are lots of hidden costs, not just the beam. You've got the rotator, the rotator cable, um, the mast, the concrete, the guy wires, all the stuff that goes along with that. There are lots of options for towers and I'm not gonna recommend one over another. I will say that safety is first. <coughs> Contesting should not be a life-threatening sport. So you should hire competent help and learn from them. Um, have your tower put up and your antennas put up by someone who knows what they're doing. Improvements on the low bands are hard um, because antennas are bigger and working DX especially uh, requires pretty good antennas. On 40 meters, you can see what the progression is. If your baseline antenna is an inverted V at 60 feet, um, moving to a two element shortened beam um, at the same height, is a pretty big improvement. That's five or six dB of gain um, and, uh, or nine or 10 dB over real ground. 
that's four dB of gain over the uh, inverted V for about a thousand bucks, 250 bucks per dB. The scores improve, improves your score by 25%. It's probably actually better than that because when you put up a beam, it tends to concentrate the energy at lower angles rather than spreading it out all over the place. If you can't afford a beam and everything that goes with it, a vertical array or a sloper array uh, that gives you some gain at low angles is a big improvement. On 80 and 160, if your baseline antenna is an inverted V at 60 feet, um, it's but those basically a cloud warmer, radiates mostly straight up. A half sloper or vertical array is a good thing to do. Verticals need lots of radials to work well. Arrays of verticals need facing boxes, which you can build um, or buy. Um, adding for a beverage so you can receive better is a less than $50 proposition and a great, uh, great improvement to your low band uh, antenna farm. Something that's often overlooked is your feed lines. Um, I've become very sensitive to feed lines lately because I started doing moon belts a few years ago. And I learned very quickly that uh, what seems like a pretty good feed line at HF is just terrible at, at uh, two meters. Um, I thought, for example, that LMR 400 was really good coax. And then I saw how much loss it had on two meters for a hundred foot run and I couldn't use it anymore. So I had to scrounge some hard line. So on HF, for HF contesting, assume you've got a tri-bander at 60 feet it's 140 feet from the shack, so you got 200 feet of feed line. And if that's RG8, you're losing 4 dB of signal on 10 meters. If you replace that with 200 feet of LMR 400, it cuts your loss by 2.4 dB. That's $83 per dB if you want to figure out what the, the cost is for that. It's equivalent to raising your power by almost double, and it helps on receive. Now, if you can scrounge some three quarter inch cable TV hard line, um, that's only got a loss of 0.4 dB. And that's uh, compared to the original case, that's 3.6 dB of gain, a 20% increase in your score just for asking nicely at the scrapyard at the cable TV company. One good rule of thumb from W3LPL is that your feed line should have no more than one dB of loss on the band of interest. And uh, that's, that's words to live by. You should also test your antenna system periodically. Most contest station failures arise from poorly installed or poor quality connectors. Um, don't buy the cheap connectors, buy the good ones and learn how to put them on correctly. I was always a big fan of soldering connectors. And uh, last year I went on a, a trip with a few other people who were doing some antenna work uh, to get ready for the DX contest um, on uh, Roatan Island uh, at HQ9X. And uh, they had to build a couple of feed lines and they had crimp type connectors. And if you have the right tool, that's really fast and really reliable. And I came home from that operation and I ordered the right crimp tool so I could do it myself. And I haven't looked back. So uh, crimp connectors are great if you have the right tool for it and learn how to use it. Um, so connectors are really, 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 really important. Um, another thing that's a problem is using mystery coax that you got at the flea market. Um, you should get an antenna analyzer and measure the loss of the coax before you use it, um, or you'll have an unpleasant surprise. Location is really important when it comes to contest stations. It takes a Herculean effort and a lot of money to overcome location problems. And by that, I mean either geography or terrain. Um, you know, I mentioned just before we got started that I've been casually running some Europeans on 80 meter FT8 to get the amplifier running and warm up the shack here a little bit. Um, I know you can't do that very well from Spokane, so that's a geography issue. Um, if uh, you have local terrain that prevents you from getting out, that's a big problem. Obviously, the right location makes all the difference. Hilltop and coastal locations are good. Valley and desert locations are bad, except maybe for sweepstakes if you're out in the desert of West Texas or New Mexico. Those guys tend to do very well in that contest. If you are in the wrong location and it is really important in your life to be doing better in contests, you got three, three options. You can move, you can go guest ops somewhere, or you can operate remote. And there are lots of options for remotes. Uh, you can rent one that's out there. You can build one with a buddy of yours or a few buddies or a club or whatever. Um, so lots of options for doing remotes. But overall, the most important part of your contest station well, what do you think it is? You think the equipment is the most important part of your station? You gotta have one of these, you gotta have a, a fancy shiny new radio. Um, 
Uh, maybe you think it's antennas. Is that the most important part of your station? How about having a big rotating tower with a giant stack of uh, long boom tribanders like that? Uh, is that gonna make the biggest difference in your station? How about location? Uh, that's one of the remote ham radio stations. That's Jonesport, Maine, uh, looking out over the Atlantic Ocean from not too far away. Um, location is important. Is that the most important thing? Nope. Most important part of your station is the guy you see in the mirror. Um, hope it's not this guy, Stuart Smalley. Uh, he's not the most important part of your station. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't think Al Franken even has a ham license. But uh, the fact of the matter is that the operator is the most important part of the station. All the other stuff is nice and will help you do a little better, but you get more approval from being a better operator. Um, that guy used to come on, by the way, and give a little talk of daily affirmation. He used to say, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and by golly, people really like me. Um, I guess there's a ham version of that, which is I'm strong enough, I'm fast enough, and people really want to work me. Um, if you say that a few times, maybe it'll help. But what you really want to do to improve your operating skill is practice, practice, and then practice some more. And I mean, real kidding, real no kidding, but in chair practice, not just clicking on the cluster. Um, that uh, doesn't really improve your operating skill very much. Um, you should operate lots of little contests, even if you can only put in a few hours. You can operate between contests, even on FT8. Uh, that'll help you to learn propagation, which bands are open at uh, what time for your station. You can work on CW copying, work on uh, timing of your calls on, on sideband. Call sign recognition is important. You hear the same call signs over and over again. You can hear two or three letters and, and miss a few and still guess who it is. You'll get to know propagation better too. Here's a game that you can play that'll help your operating skill. Um, turn on your radio, find a band that's open and tune through the band for five or 10 minutes and write down all the calls you can copy. And then when you can't copy anymore, check the DX cluster or the reverse beacon network and see how many calls you found and how many good ones you missed. And the skills you'll pick up there are moving quickly through a band, identifying calls, uh, not staying too long when the guy's not signing his call, things like that. And uh, if you can beat the spots, I love it when I find stuff before the uh, cluster, the guys on the cluster find it or before someone pops up on the RBN. That's, that's, uh, that's a great challenge. Another non-obvious way to improve your skills is to read the contest write-ups, especially the line scores. Um, read the guys in the top 10 boxes. If you keep reading the same call signs over and over again, they will find their way into your subconscious memory and you will become a human super check partial. I, I listened, I operated a little bit in the CWT con mini contest last night. And what I noticed was um, there were some calls that I didn't recognize. And uh, I took a, a few breaks in the middle to listen to other guys. And th they would hear uh, just pieces of calls, but they would go back to the full call because they work the same guy every week in these contests. Every Wednesday night they work them or in, in the middle of the day or in the morning. So the same guys are running that contest. And if you only hear the suffix, most of the time you can fill in the prefix. Um, so that helps a lot, having a good call sign vocabulary. I have another whole talk on call sign vocabularies that I'm not gonna do today. Um, so when it comes to improving your operator skills, there really aren't any shortcuts. Um, there's no dollars per dB factor. You can't buy time. And people talk about the 10,000 hour rule. Have you heard of that? Well, 10,000 hours is 200 plus 48 hour single ops. And if that's what it takes to get really good, because there are some books written about the 10,000 hour rule saying you need to operate 10, you need to do something for 10,000 hours to be really good at it. But that actually applies to becoming one of the best in the world, whether it's an elite athlete, the Beatles, Larry Bird, Bill Gates, um, a grandmaster at chess, N6MJ or KL9A. Um, those guys have put in the time and they are really at the top of, of the sport. Um, if you're really interested in learning more about the 10,000 hour rule, the guy who wrote about it was uh, um, a guy at uh, uh, one of the Florida colleges named K. Anders Erickson. He's published a bunch of academic papers on um, how long it takes to become excellent at something. But there's another school of thought, a guy named Josh Kaufman, 
says that if you put in 20 hours of deliberate and serious practice, you become competent enough to recognize your mistakes and self-correct. In other words, you've gotten good enough to know what you don't know, and you can improve from there. Um, he did a, a, an absolutely fantastic TED Talk, which if you look up uh, Josh Kaufman and the first 20 hours, um, uh, you can watch it on YouTube. It's, uh, it's about a 15 or 20 minute talk. Um, and one of the things I'll get as a little bit of a spoiler, um, he always wanted to learn how to play the ukulele. So he got a ukulele and he got some books on how to, how to learn how to do it. And they were crazy. There was, a, you know, hundreds of chords to learn. But then he discovered that you only need to learn about four chords to be able to play 90% of the songs that you, that you would ever want to play. So he learned those four chords and got really good at them. And after about 20 hours of practicing the ukulele, he got good enough to play a whole lot of songs. Um, so it's a great talk and it, uh, it really does to help. So in our game, in radio contesting, here's a 20 hour success story. Um, a lot of people are aware that we have a, a very famous admiral, uh, former retired admiral, uh, Scott Red K0DQ, who's won a lot of contests and been doing it for a very long time. But there's another retired admiral who's in contesting, N4OC. And the two of those guys operated in Aruba in 2010 in the ARLDX contest. Um, now, N4OC, by the way, his name is Ed Giambastian, Giambastiani. No one can pronounce it, not even him. Um, he has his own page on Wikipedia, so you can look him up. That's where I stole this picture. The, he, he hadn't operated a contest in over 30 years, had never used computer logging, um, and had never operated outside the U.S. Um, so he and Scott sat down to operate. Scott uh, did the first few hours, and Ed kind of watched what was going on. And he was a little shaky at first, but after about 20 hours, he was running guys at 150 an hour plus. So um, 20 hours is a good round number for how, to, uh, how much practice you need to put in if you're a pretty good learner to, uh, to get good at the game. You also need to have a very supportive family if you're going to play this game seriously. This quote is from a friend of mine who uh, I will not identify who said there's nothing like having a wedding anniversary fall in the ARLDXW weekend, just ask my first wife. Um, implication being that he has a second wife. Um, you need to make sure you reserve your contest weekends well in advance. Uh, verify dates for scheduled events like, content, like concerts. I once blew a, a 160 contest because I, was, uh, um, I wasn't paying attention to the calendar. My wife came to me in about October and said, hey, this." Uh, there's a concert I want to go to in December. Can we go? And I said, yeah, okay, sure. It looks like a good weekend. And then I realized it was the same weekend as the 160 contest. I did operate the first weekend and we went to the concert, the first night, we, then we went to the concert on Saturday night. So I managed to do a little bit of both. The concert was great. I wish I had been able to operate the whole contest though. So a few final thoughts. Your contestation is a system. There are a lot of pieces to the system, but in general, they boil down to your equipment, your antennas, your location, and your operator. And optimizing your station for contesting requires equal attention to all pieces of the system. Put a lot of money and effort into one and ignore the others, and you're not going to see the improvement that you could have gotten. And as Mel said at the beginning, here's a good way to spend 20 bucks to learn a little more about the game. Um, I checked today, and it's uh, it's now currently ranked number eight hundred and fifty nine thousand eight hundred and twenty six in books on Amazon. So maybe we can uh, get it up into the uh, eight hundred and fifty eight thousand range uh, if everyone buys a whole bunch of copies. Uh, but that's a book that the uh, ARL approached me a few years ago to put together, and it was a lot of fun to write. I had a lot of good help from a lot of a lot of people over the years uh, teaching me. And it was uh, great to be able to give back uh, some of what I've learned in the form of a book. And that is the end of what I got to say. All right. Great. Uh, one of the things I love about your book, by the way, is all the uh, pictures that illustrate your points. It, it, it's a really uh, visual reinforcement. No question about it. Uh, and uh, the other thing I, that just surprised me that how much I liked is actually the definitions at the back. 
uh, because th there were terms I didn't know. And I, that was really handy. So Great. I encourage anybody who's uh, kind of getting into contesting, get the book. <laughs>